Well, hello and welcome to my aquarium. You'll notice the plants aren't doing particularly well. Scuba Steve seems to be doing fine, uh, but he's ceramic, so he doesn't count. Why in the world are we in an aquarium right now? Well, well, first of all, this is a first. I don't think a lecture on natural law has ever been given from inside an aquarium, so congratulations on, to us to being, you know, kind of weird. Uh, but we're in an aquarium because I wanted to show you. This is an aquarium that's about two weeks old. The leaves are not doing very well. The plants are not doing very well. The water is a bit cloudy. And what you're seeing right now is actually part of what's called a nitrogen cycle. When you start an aquarium, for those of you who might not have an aquarium, uh, there are certain processes that need to happen by nature. Uh, ammonia is a toxin to fish that's created by the dying leaves and fish food and all kinds of things. So as ammonia increases in the natural environment or in an aquarium, Beneficial bacteria grow, they uh, turn the ammonia into what's called nitrite, a name humans have made up. And other bacteria come in and they turn the nitrite into nitrate. Each one of these chemicals is progressively less toxic to the environment. But when I got involved, I noticed the fish weren't too, dealing so well with the initial environment. So I added a little bit of salt to help with gill function and I added a little bit of this and a little bit of that for the fertilizer to help the plants. Long story short, I had to drain all the water out and refill. This is a 75 gallon tank. Why are we talking about this? Because natural law theory says that human beings have certain natural goods, that the very universe itself has certain natural goods. Things that we can identify even just as self-evident, they're just obvious to us, that are good. And when our laws don't reflect those, there's a problem. And some of those things that are good are moral things, things about how to live, how to act, what is the good life? Is happiness something that all human beings should pursue? And the answer for most natural law theorists is that these things tell us, well, yes, that happiness is something we should be pursuing. Yes, there are natural or obvious self-evident goods. And that when our laws don't reflect or embody those, they're sickly, they're unhealthy. By contrast, some theorists say, well, there's no such thing as natural law. Laws are just what cultures make up. So your culture has its laws, that culture has its laws. No culture can say to another culture, your laws are better or worse than mine. For the natural law theorists, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because like this aquarium, life runs by laws. Life runs by certain goods and balances in a, in a balancing act of say bacteria with the toxic ammonia. And our laws need to reflect that balancing act on how to create, say, more life. So when cultures get screwed up with bad laws, they end up looking like this aquarium. They start to wilt, they start to get a little, they maybe even die. Maybe they get wiped out, the fish die. Or in this case, entire cultures may find themselves at war, civil war, uh, and an unhealthy relationship with humans among humans. And humans among nature, of course, is also part of this. So the conversation of natural law ask you and asks you and I, you know, why do I follow the law? Why do I believe that my country's laws are justified? Sure, I don't want to get arrested. Uh, you know, the police, they have guns. I'll do what I'm told. But at the end of the day, the legitimacy of law is at stake. Answering the question, why should I believe in it, is at stake. And for natural law theorists, we should believe in it and we should follow it because it has an enduring or ongoing or uh, a real substance to it that's more than just cultural consensus or arbitrary whim. These guys are pretty cool. Uh, the twig catfish, uh, this is another aquarium. This, this aquarium is established, it's going quite well. These guys are uh, otherworldly. But if any one variable for these twig catfish is off, if the pH is too high, if the water temperature is incorrect, uh, they'll die. They simply won't survive because their context isn't congruent to life. Laws for natural law theorists are supposed to be congruent to life, human flourishing, the good. Now, yes, there are many ways we can answer what is the good, but it's still a question that we're all trying to answer. For natural law theory, ideas such as justice and freedom, equality, fairness, these big terms that you and I could spend our lifetime unpacking, these terms have meaning outside more than just the immediate culture in which we live. The whole world can share in some sense of justice and freedom and equality. All human beings are striving towards this. We realize it in different ways. It may look slightly different, but it all, you know, all roads lead to Rome in, in a certain respect. 
Law and morality are connected for natural law theorists. Law and morality are connected. By contrast, in the next video, we're going to be talking about legal positivism that tries to separate law and morality. It sees these things as mutually exclusive in some ways. I mean, not, it doesn't completely disregard morality, but a conversation about the law is a conversation about a closed system, something we can treat scientifically for the legal positivists. But for the natural law philosophers or thinkers or theorists, these things have to go together. If you want legitimate law, it has to respond to something good. Again, what does that mean? Uh, big question. It goes without saying that law can be contextual. You can have two cultures side by side in the same geographic location, relatively speaking, side by side geographically, and they see one group of people entirely differently. They may see this one group of people as freedom fighters, and another culture might see them as terrorists. Uh, you can have cultures in which the hoarding of wealth, if you're a billionaire or trillionaire, is a sign of success. Everybody should aspire to be like that. Another culture would look at the same people and say uh, that that's the kind of greed uh, and, and terrible selfishness and hoarding that um, is, is immoral and that shouldn't be permitted. Indeed, we do see these things differently across cultures. But the natural law theorist argues that if we look deep enough, if we look past um, personal preferences, and we really think about these questions, what does it mean for a culture to be good, to flourish? What does it mean for human life to be successful? We'd come to a more of a consensus regarding what is good than what we typically have right now. So in a way it's optimistic we would have greater consensus if we really thought about it, but it's also practical because I think we will all agree to a certain thing, a few things I'm gonna discuss in just a moment, a brief list of things that we would take as self-evident that are shared among human beings. If you're tempted to think, well, natural law theory must be wrong off the top because clearly laws are arbitrary and depend on culture, again, just remember that maybe that's because some cultures have simply been more successful than others at figuring out what is natural, what is good, what is healthy. The pond you're looking at right now is full of catfish as well. This pond hasn't been touched. Uh, no, per no one's come along and put a dam in there. Uh, I've never tried to adjust any kind of chemicals in this pond and try to make it better. We've heard stories time and again where humans go into a natural setting and we try to make it better. And of course, we can't possibly calculate all the variables, so we make it worse. We're constantly making it worse while trying to make things better. So it's a bit egotistical to say, in a way, these are laws, these are natural laws that give us a sense of right and wrong. And now we're gonna write these natural laws into human laws, into human language, and we're gonna apply them to culture. There are going to be mistakes. There are going to be a lot of mistakes regarding how we take what is universal, maybe what's universal because God put it there, universal because nature is just the way nature is, maybe there's karma behind all, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about this ultimate reality that gives us ideas of justice and equality and freedom. But there are gonna be mistakes in applying it. So that too shouldn't be taken as an inherent criticism that says natural law theory must be false because it's so hard to apply, it's so hard to connect these things. This is a big job of trying to make sense of what is right. In the case of nature, we can let nature be by and large, but human beings need to write laws. We need to make things um, concrete. We need to make them uh, readable and shareable. We need to codify these things so that we can run societies and we can have, hopefully, peace among our members. So the law, having law is a necessary thing for a peaceful, harmonious society. But having good laws are hard to come by sometimes. And you may know of some laws right now that you feel are just entirely immoral, that don't connect with your moral compass at all. And the more you think about it, the less sense they make. And indeed, that's a huge problem. But only, only if we agree that law and morality should go together. If we don't think they should go together, as some theorists do, then the criticism is ill-founded. But for many, the legitimacy of the law is dependent on, the, on heralding that call to morality, of respecting that call to morality. Again, one of the big claims of natural law theory is that the law is basically universal. And without that sense of universality, we would actually have a number of problems applying the law in running societies. 
Here's an example, a famous example, of the Nuremberg Trials, 1945-1946, in which we find a panel of eight judges from a number of different major powers who sat over dozens of trials regarding significant Nazi leaders who did bad things. So these judges are all coming from different legal systems, and now they're responsible for judging these criminals, these war criminals. The war criminals respond with, I was following orders. I was following the law. The German law said, do these things that we would all agree are terrible. Do these things. So their response is, my law said do that. Whatever it was. The natural law theorist responds to that with, well, well you were following a law created by humans, but it wasn't a natural law because it wasn't a moral law. It wasn't connected to universal goods. It wasn't connected to self-evident goods about what humans need, like life, like freedom, equality. So your argument, I was just following the law, wasn't really a law. It wasn't a natural law. It was an artificial law. Now, in some sense, all laws are artificial, of course, but it wasn't a response to human good. And so the judges were able to, hey, you guys are guilty of crimes against humanity. Why? Because all humans can agree that murdering, invading, starting wars, going after non-combatants and, and treating them as civilians as criminals to be gassed and whatnot, that is just self-evidently not a natural good thing to do. And so we can hold you accountable even though you belong to a legal system that's different than ours. The judges, in other words, were appealing to a higher law or a more foundational principled law rather than just social convention, peer pressure, what have you. We have a world right now full of dictators and despots and all kinds of bad people who justify their behavior by saying, the law says it's okay. So if the law says it's okay to drop chemicals into a river that you know is gonna poison the village down the street or down the, down the river, does that make it okay? The natural law theorist goes, no, just because it's not a law doesn't mean that morality doesn't govern whether or not you should do it. And in the best of all situations, morality and the law will be harmonious, connected, meaningfully connected. To put this into a bit of a catchphrase, natural law theory says that the standards of human morality are taken from the nature of the universe itself. So we figure out morality based on the universe itself. And these lie at the foundation of our laws. Our legal systems are a response to our morality and our morality is derived from the universe itself. I'm using different terms kind of interchangeably, but the, boil that down even more. What we think as a community is good isn't just what we think as a community. So what we think is good, it applies universally. Why does it apply universally? because it's genuinely good for everybody else. That's tricky, because some people think having little chihuahuas in a purse is good for them and it's good for everybody. Well, I'm not sure that that's the case. Some people think having real coral in an aquarium, which I don't do, having real coral in an aquarium is good because it's aesthetic, but that would be actually pretty bad for the environment. So we have a hard time as a species figuring out what is good. But again, let's not make that a critique of natural law theory off the top because it's going to be difficult. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean the theory itself is somehow invalidated. As diverse as natural law theories can be, they agree generally on three things. So whether it's Aquinas is one of the first and most famous uh, natural law theorists. Uh, Finnis is one of the more recent ones. Three things. First, the laws require human reasons to figure out. These laws aren't just gonna show up on our front door. We have to create them, we have to codify them, we have to write them down, but to, to do that, we have to use reason to really think about the nature of life. We have to think about the nature of politics. We have to think about the nature of human beings. We have to think about nature. We have to think about these things. How do these things work? How do these things work together? How do aquariums go bad? And when we can figure out how human societies go bad, how life is not realized, how we frustrate knowledge, how we uh, take away people's liberties and certain freedoms, then we can make better laws. But it requires thinking about it. It's not just going to be by instinct, and it's certainly not just by social convention. Pop culture doesn't get to di dictate laws. Right? That's just too arbitrary. Two, some basic human goods are self-evident. 
like life. We would just naturally assume, and I'll, get, I'll give you a shorter list in just a second, or longer list, but a short list nonetheless. Uh, hum, there are just some things we agree on, like living. It's self-evidently good. We don't need to argue it. We don't need to fight over it. I mean, we could, but let's not kid ourselves. We all want to live. And if we don't, and some of us don't, we generally consider that to be a sign of, of illness, and we try to help people like that to restore health, health of mind, health of will. Okay. And three, this is a big one, the best laws create a social order, create a world, create a society in which there is a search for a common good for all, a common good for all. This is in wild contrast to, well, I'm sure you many historical examples come to mind, kings and queens in power, uh, the wealthy of the elite in power. Uh, that's not okay. Natural law theorists, common good for all. And a good that realizes some sense of human betterment, not just a maintaining of the status quo, but better and better and better, because that's nature, right? Trees flourish. A tree that begins to grow and then withers and then dies like my aquarium, that's not the, we want the aquarium to flourish, to be happy, to be healthy, to vibrant colors and fish to live in it. Likewise, our laws should be facilitating something like that. Aquinas observed that some laws are simply better than others. And the answer to the question, why should I follow certain laws but not other laws, is well, the answer is because some laws are more moral. They're simply more moral. Figuring that out is difficult because there are a couple of problems. Here's one. What we often think is good is not because we're ignorant sometimes of what the good is, especially if we're immature. Uh, we need to grow. We need to have life experiences. We need to, we need to figure these things out. I'll be honest. Tonight, I had too many chicken fingers at dinner. I was going to eat five. And my boys were going to have six or seven. They're, one of them's four, one of them's nine. They were going to have more than me, but that's okay. I, I need to worry you know, a little bit more about what I eat. I ended up eating 10, and I don't feel good right now. I thought I knew what was good, but then I acted outside of what I should. I was ignorant. I was misinformed of how much I should eat. Well, think of it this way. Uh, this is a more common thing for middle-aged men. I'm going to go out tomorrow. I'm going to buy a sports car. I'm not because I can't afford it. But let's say I do, and I still can't afford it. Why would I have done something like that? For Aquinas, we do kind of intuit right and wrong. Reason helps us understand right and wrong. But sometimes we're ignorant, and sometimes emotion overcomes discipline. These are huge problems with creating laws. Sometimes people create laws that favor white people because they don't like black people. Sometimes people create laws that prevent women from having any kind of political vote because they like maintaining power and they generally think women don't have equal status and so on and so on and so on. So breaking through some of our cultural barriers, our biases and our prejudices to see the good of nature is a big task, but that too shouldn't be something to instinctively or automatically dissuade us from thinking about natural law as just something that's impossible. Hobbes is an example of a famous political thinker who boils down to saying basically this, there's one natural right or natural law and that's self-interest, self-preservation. And based on that one natural thing, it's kind of self-evident to us all that we want to be alive, we want to be protected from conflict. That leads us into creating uh, a sovereign or someone over top of us to whom we give some of our liberties and some of our rights. And this sovereign guarantees peace or harmony in a culture, but nothing more. No flourishing. It doesn't mean we're happy in the culture. It just means that we're not in a constant state of war. So this minimal kind of natural right leads to the creation of all kinds of laws with the end result of peace, hopefully, but not a whole lot else. Okay, that's a very minimal way of thinking about it. John Locke comes along and goes, no, 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 I don't agree with that. In fact, I think that we are governed by natural law to do good. So morality has a much stronger calling on us specifically to give more natural basic rights or to secure, to protect more natural basic rights. And for Locke, that was life, liberty, and property. So not just peace, not just self-preservation, that you're alive, don't be greedier than that, be happy with what you have. This is life, liberty, and property. Does your culture, are your laws securing that? It's not hard to look at something like North Korea and to hear about these work camps, but I've never been there. Uh, obviously, um, so I, I can't speak with any authority on it. 
But the stories that are coming out of these places, it's incredible um, how so many countries still, their laws aren't even interested in the basics. In the basic, basic that we, I think most of us would quickly agree, that's not okay. A more contemporary example of natural law theory is found in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. If you've never seen the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, never read it, go check that out. Here are a few of them, just a few of the articles to give you this idea that there are universal things, universal ways to see human beings and that law should reflect that. It's not just people coming up with stuff on, on the fly, on the whim. Article number one, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and, sh conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Wow, okay, so all human beings are born. How are they born? They're born naturally, by nature. They're born this way, free and equal in dignity and rights. That is huge. Again, natural law theory saying that underneath social convention, is everybody's born equal and with dignity and endowed with reason. Wow, and conscience. Now, Article three, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. So when a law violates that, a social law, uh, war breaks out, it's a problem. It's, it's frustrating, not just morality, but that whole sense of what is good. Article number four, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all of their forms. Article six, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. We could spend weeks, months going through these to unpack them. But the point is, these ideas have legitimacy because of a belief in natural law, a higher principle or a higher idea that is not just given power because the ruling body says, yeah, we agree with it today, but we might not agree with it tomorrow. No, no, no. These ideas are supposed to be universal and forever. And I think most of us can probably agree with them. Unfortunately, something like the Declaration of Human Rights is relatively recent in human history. The belief in natural law may have fueled many, many cultures, but we've been very slow as a species to realize it and to begin to try and apply it and to have international law at all. John Finnis is an example of a modern uh, natural law theorist. Uh, his famous text, one of his famous texts, Natural Law and Natural Rights. In that text, he looks at Plato and Aristotle and he looks for nine basic human goods. So here's the list that I promised you. See what you think. Do you think these are more or less self-evident goods that every person can agree to and that every law should try to protect? One is life. Well, I hope you would agree that life is, you know, living is good. Otherwise, none of these other things would matter. Knowledge. That's interesting. Work and play. I mean, all of these need to be unpacked. We don't have time for that. But aesthetic experience or the experience of beauty as an essential human good? I would say yes. Social ability or friendship? Yeah. Practical reasoning or the ability to think? Yeah. And religion? But well, most of the planet is religious, so probably, yeah. These seem to be self-evident goods. And again, when laws do not reflect these or do not protect these, there's a problem. But only if natural law theory is correct. Theoretically, you could have a culture that might value life, but maybe it values artificial life and not human life in which case other things like social ability, reasoning, and religion get pushed to the side. So it has, you can imagine an entire culture of robots and artificial intelligence with completely different values than us. Could we say that they could run their culture by natural law? Uh, in a very thin way, maybe, because they're not realizing these goods. What are the goods of artificial intelligence? Well, that's a whole different conversation. But when we get to legal positivism, they begin to treat the law as if it was almost being thought of by robots. They want to separate any conversation of morality from an immediate context of the law. The morality can come in later through application, but basically they want to push that to the side and just deal with the law as almost like a, a, a logic table or a logic puzzle. 
like these robots or the artificial intelligence in this hypothetical world that we're imagining. That's an interesting contrast between natural law and this other thing we're going to positive or positive law. We'll get back to that. So what can we say about natural law? From the very beginning, it's going to be difficult to overcome the arbitrariness problem because each culture does have different laws. But it's not hard to imagine or to begin to see that we connect all along, whether it's the Nuremberg trials or something else. We can see the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. We can see how there's a sense of commonality of the pursuit of life and liberty and made property. It's not hard to sell it once you see it. It just feels like, yeah, that's a good idea. I want that, and I want that for other people. So natural law theory is persuasive and powerful for a number of reasons. Again, it gives that sense of legitimacy to the law. It also gives us a sense of, this is why I should follow the law. I understand now why it matters. And it matters not just because I'm afraid of punishment. It matters because I want my society to be healthy and to flourish, and I want to be healthy and to flourish. But what if that's all just kind of made up? What if that's just too lofty? Maybe that's a version of the law that's expecting too much. And these problems of interpretation, these problems of making sense of what the good is, are, these are all indicators that we shouldn't be following natural law theory. We need something completely different. Well, we'll talk about that next.